Good morning. Yeah, it's so good to see your faces. I came ready this morning with water and tissue in case I needed this week. A um, little public service announcement. We owe congratulations to Kathy Bakari today because she at just her, she just got the cutest granddaughter you've ever seen. You know how you see newborn pictures, and especially of your own, and you think they're so cute, and some you're just going, ooh. You know, because newborns, they just, you know, just can look really squishy and, you know, funny. This, but ask Kathy, raise your hand. Kath, ask Kathy to show you a picture of this precious little baby girl, Arabelle. So anyway, I just wanted to, just for your enjoyment, you would, you would enjoy it. She's beautiful, and we're so happy. God has answered our prayers for her safe delivery. So anyway, let me go ahead and start us with prayer. Father, thank you for this time we could have together. Thank you for new life, for the, this new baby that safely arrived on the planet. Lord, you are our life. You are the one that gives life. And we just thank you for this study that we've enjoyed and this week diving into you being the resurrection and the life. There's so much we could talk about, Lord. You are so good. And um, I pray you would use what you've taught me over these last few weeks to be uh, edifying and encouraging to these precious ladies. You love them so much. And Lord, I know um, that the words you've given me, I want them to be for your glory, Lord, and not for mine, but always praising you. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. Amen. Okay, this week in our lesson, Jesus asked the question, do you believe I am able to do this? Many of you, like me, I know, grew up knowing the Old Testament part of the Bible. Noah and the ark. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Esther, Ruth. I mean, what am I missing any of your favorites? King David, Jonah and the big fish. Someone recently mentioned to me that they were working with some elementary age children. I don't know if this was in a Sunday school setting or what, but they said that these children did not know these stories. My heart broke because not only are they awesome stories, but that you can also, through these stories, of course, we're seeing the other side. We see how God took all the circumstances in their life and worked it for his good and, their, and for their good and his glory. But um, you can also see that they were frail, sinful human beings <laughs> that God used. And much like us, they probably heard the question, do you believe I'm able to do this? As we talk about Jesus' statement, I am the resurrection and the life, I want to look back at just a few of those Old Testament stories, those powerful examples of his provision, of his resurrecting and bringing life to situations. Let's start with Noah. In Genesis 5, uh, Genesis 6 begins the story of Noah and his family. And in Scripture, Noah was known as a righteous man, blameless in his generation, which really, if you think about it, is not saying that much because God was ready to destroy all of them except him. So <laughs> he must have really stood out. But evidently, he was the only righteous one because God told him, I'm going to destroy the earth with rain and water, and I'm going to give you some specks to build an ark out of gopher wood. And so Noah proceeded to do this. He believed that God was going to do what he said he was going to do. Do you, it is estimated that it took 50 to 75 years to build that ark. Can you imagine? Lord, are you sure you're going to do About year 20, are you saying, Lord, it's been 20 years. You know, I, I'm, I'm still working on this. Maybe year 70? But 75 years is what it's estimated it took. And do you know how long they were on the ark? 371 days. I always used to think, oh, well, 40 days of rain, and then, and then you waited a little while, and then you left the ark. 371 days is what they believe. If you, and I started trying to add it up myself. I was looking at, in, through the scripture, and I, finally I was like, my math is not going to. Mm. So I just Googled it. But anyway, Noah 
Do you believe I'm able to do this? What about Abram and Sarai? It's so hard to call them by those names because we know they got changed later. But God called Abram and Sarai to pack up all their things and move away from family to a place that God was going to give them. A place where he would make him the father of many, many nations. And his descendants would, would be as vast as the stars in the sky. They would number like the stars in the sky. Um, and in Genesis 12 through 18, God re-emphasized that covenant over and over several times with him. But in chapter 17, at the age of 89 for Sarai and 99 for Abram, he said, I'm going to give you some new names. So he named him Abraham and Sarah. And one year later, Sarah had a baby boy. Miracle. It was 25 years between God said, go to this new land, and when she became pregnant. 25 years. How would you like to be pregnant when you're 90 years old? I'm sorry. I wouldn't want to be at 62. Abraham and Sarah, do you believe that he is able to do this? You know they questioned. You know they did. They, they even, well, we'll talk about that later. Joseph. One of my faves, I, lo I love the J's, the Joseph, Jude, James, and Jonah. Those are my, some of my favorites. But Joseph, in Genesis 37, we learn about Jacob's favorite son. Okay, is that ever a good idea to have a favorite son out of your 12 sons? Give him a nice coat, brag on him all the time? No, it's never a good thing. But he was also the dreamer, called the dreamer. He was 17 years old and probably wearing his fancy coat, when his brothers had had it up to here with the stories about how in his dream they were all going to bow down to him. So they sold him, sold him away, at least they didn't kill him, but they sold him to some Ishmaelites who were passing by. Does anyone remember the significance of Ishmaelites here? I'm sure a lot of you do. For those who are like me, at first, probably read this story a million times and never gave that much thought. This time I gave it a lot more thought. And I'm like, oh yeah, Ishmael. That was Abraham and Sarah's backup plan, remember? God was not giving them a son quick enough, so Ishmael was the son of uh, Abraham. And uh, so now here, God is using descendants of Ishmael to accomplish his purpose of getting Joseph to Egypt to, you know, the rest of the story. Isn't that neat? So anyway, you know, he was sold to, Joseph was sold to a man named Potiphar and uh, put in charge of his household. But Potiphar's wife falsely accused him of sexual assault and he was thrown into prison for something he didn't do. But God prospered him there and he interpreted some dreams. And then a couple years later, the cupbearer goes, oh, Pharaoh, you have a dream that we can't interpret. I know this guy and he's in prison. So anyway, Joseph is brought out, he interprets Pharaoh's dream, and then he's put second only to Pharaoh to help save the nations from the feast and famine that was to come. By the time Joseph's brothers came to Egypt, two years into the famine years, to say, we want to buy grain, our families are starving, it had been 22 years. Joseph was now 39 years old. It had been 22 years since he'd seen his father and his brothers. Joseph, do you believe God's able to accomplish his plans? That's a long time for those promises to come along, for God to answer, you know, what he, the plans he had. Do you believe he's able? As we looked at these examples in God's word and in our own lives, do you think we believe? Do you believe he can re- he can resurrect our lives like he did for those Old Testament saints? Can he bring life to what we deem to be dead? Like a flooded planet or a barren womb. Like being in prison for a crime you didn't even commit. I am the resurrection and the life. On the screen, we're going to look at some definitions for life and uh, resurrection, but we're going to start with this uh, first one. Life, the period from birth to death, existence, essence, 
viability. I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty easy. It's like, what's the meaning of life? Well, it means you're alive, you know. But I love the existence and essence, your, your essence. We're going to see how through these um, next little bit where essence, existence, life will mean something to us too. The Greek pneuma, what does that remind you of? Pneumonia, right. Pneuma means, was, is the Greek for life, but it's breath, spirit, and soul. Pneumon is the Greek that, that is pneumonia, but it, is, it has to do with lung, lung disease. So, and then kaim is how you pronounce the Hebrew name for life. And then um, the next screen shows eternal life. I wanted to kind of go to that, forever living. You know, we know that life means you're, li- you know, you're living, your essence, you're existing. But eternal life is the kind of life that God is going to give us, that he gives us now. We are in eternal life right now because even though our bodies are going to die, we get to go on. And then, let me see if I pronounce this right, ruach, ruach, that is the Hebrew for Holy Spirit. But you see, you'll see connection here in a little bit, referring to wind or breath, mind, spirit, spirit, life, soul. You see how they're all kind of connected? And then the next slide, we have resurrection, awakening from the dead, rebirth, restoration, a resurgence, a revival, a return to life. So interconnected. Um, and the Greek, I believe, is anastasis or anastasis or something like that. I've looked up so many pronunciations, I just I gave up on them. And this, this is an interesting word. That's, that's what the Greek word for resurrection. But there's actually a medical thing, and I have it very small here, so I'm going to look. It's a natural cell recovery phenomenon that rescues cells from the brink of death. It's a thing. Um, but I don't know. I can't explain all the medical terms for that. But in the Hebrew, oh, I'm going to forget how to pronounce it. Tukiot. Tukiot is the word for resurrection, and then tukiat hamayim means resurrection of the dead. So I just thought those were kind of interesting. What now? Take my earring off? Is it? Okay. I'm clicking. Okay. No more clicking. Those were my mama's earrings she gave me right before she died. Yeah, I wore them in honor of her today. Um, but looking at these definitions, you can see how life, resurrection are inextricably linked. In John Piper's book, Providence, have anyone familiar with that book? I'm the only nerd here. Are you? Are you it's like this thick, it's, but it's so awesome. Um, in his book, he refers to, to the words in the American Declaration of Independence. And y'all know these. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men, blah, 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 are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. According to this proclamation, no human has a right to take another human's life. You are entitled. You have a right to live. You have a right to life. This owes to God's commandments, which is what our Constitution and our Declaration of Independence are based on, Judeo-Christian laws and rules and God's word in Exodus 20 13 says you shall not murder so that's kind of an understood but John Piper goes on to say this and I since I'm quoting him I'm going to read it make make sure I read it right he goes on to say we should not confuse a right to life in relation to other people with a right to life in relation to God we have no right to life in relation to God God has absolute rights over our lives. He gives and he takes away. He gives and takes life according to the principle that Jesus laid down in Matthew 20, 15 that said, am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? One of my favorite people, I told you the Jays, is Job. 
And on screen you'll see Job 12.10 says, In his hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. There's that life and breath. Another Job scripture, Job 33.4, says, The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. He is the life giver. Life, breath, essence, existence, rebirth, restoration. They're all tied together. This past week, we studied one of the sweetest stories in the, uh, in the New Testament concerning the actual resurrection of someone who had died, and that was the Lazarus story. And she did a wonderful job, so I'm not going to go back through all of that. But a sweet story of friendship and faith and then Jesus' humanness, too. In John 11, during the account of Lazarus' death and resurrection, this is when Jesus declared... I am the resurrection and the life. John eleven twenty five 25 and through 27, Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Can I get an amen there? Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Do you believe this, ladies? When I first worked through this lesson in the middle of December, um, I have wrestled with this lesson. And um, the, especially the question where she said, where he, Jesus says, do you believe that I'm able to do this? And on page 165, there was a question that says, where do you need more faith to believe that with God everything is possible? But around the middle of December when I was working on this particular lesson, the answer I wrote for the, was for the physical healing of my brother Lee, who had just a few weeks before been diagnosed with stage 4 cancer. Did I believe with all my heart that God could heal my brother? I did, absolutely. God is sovereign, and I believe he can do anything he wants. Do I believe that God taking my brother home with him a few days later on December 28th, that, that showed a lack of faith on my part? No, I don't. No, this is my opinion. When my son Andrew was two and a half years old, he's now 36, so there's a good end to the story, of course. He was experiencing blackouts and weird seizure-like behavior. We didn't know what was going on, and he was... That finally, an MRI showed he had an arachnoid cyst the size of a grapefruit in his brain. Rare. Arachnoid cysts are so rare. But, of course, our son had it because his dad is a doctor. And everything weird happens to doctors, children, and wives. Just, I could tell you stories. <laughs> I could tell you stories. But anyway, after much discussion about our options, and there weren't really clear options at that point. It was like, ah, what should we do? Um... And working with our surgeon, we scheduled surgery to place a shunt in his brain to drain the cyst. And Paul and I had a couple of weeks before the surgery was going to happen. And so we prayed and we prayed and we said, you know, we just, we're just going to ask God to heal this. We're going to ask God to just evaporate that cyst. And so the day, we just prayed in faith. And the day before the surgery, we asked our doctor, would you please do one more CT scan? We want to make sure... You know, we think God's going to heal it. And guess what? He didn't. <laughs> I got you. Okay. He didn't. The cyst was still there. I'm so sorry. Kim, Kim got a kick out of that one. Did I believe that God could evaporate that cyst? Had I seen and heard of it happening before? Yes. Did I believe he could do it? Yes. Did I want it to happen? Yes. Do I believe that God's choosing not to evaporate that cyst and instead using surgery to, to take care of it showed a lack of faith on my part? No, I don't think so. To me, it showed he's sovereign. He is good. And no matter what happens, he gives, he takes away, but he's good. You know, when friends and loved ones started getting sick, literally, all over the world in early 2020 with a brand new virus 
that we now call COVID-19. We prayed for healing. We prayed for protection. We prayed and believed that God could keep us safe from this. We did. We did. Did we still lose loved ones to this virus? Absolutely we did. There's probably not a person in this room that doesn't know at least one person it's gone. We believed. Do I think that folks dying from this virus means we didn't have enough faith? No. And this is me talking here. And I asked the Lord for permission to share this. <laughs> this is my thoughts based on what I understand about my precious Lord. I believe that my faith or my smallness uh, or the smallness of it may sometimes limit what I can accomplish, but it does not limit my God or what he can accomplish through me or accomplish through that situation that I prayed about, believing, Lord, we want a safe delivery. Lord, we want, um, what I mean, we can think of so many things I've, you've prayed for, and we'll get to that again in a minute, but I'm still going to pray. I'm still going to ask in faith, and I'm going to trust that he knows what's best and that he is sovereign and he is good. Page 159 in our lesson had a quote from John Piper, and good, it's going to be on the screen. I thought it was very good. The crucial issue in advancing the kingdom of God is not the quantity of our faith but the power of God. Aren't you glad? Because there's times when I feel like my faith is this small. Of course, he said, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, God can use whatever we have. I praise God that his will is going to be done and his plans are going to come to fruition and they're not dependent on my faith or lack thereof. Even when my faith is small, he is big. My God is big. Because of our level of faith, or even despite it, God includes us in his plans, and he use, uses flawed, sinful human beings, like Abraham and Sarah deciding to go to plan B and say, let's have a child through this little servant girl, Hagar. And we know how that went. And what about a braggadocious teenager named Joseph? The Old Testament saints were not perfect, nor was their faith. But God used the faith that they had at the time to accomplish his purposes. And I'm sure he taught them some really good lessons along the way. <laughs> he grew their faith. He's also growing our faith through our prayers and through our circumstances that he allows in our lives. Yahweh alone holds the power over life and death and resurrection. Um, I reached out to my group to just say, are they, what are some prayers you've been praying for a long time maybe? Some have been answered now, some you're still praying about, and actually went to some different sources along with them, so I'm just going to throw out a few here. Perhaps praying for adult children or adult grandchildren and asking God to rescue them from their poor choices. Maybe prayers for God to show his purpose for you following a divorce. Lord, this is not what I bargained for, not what I wanted. Or maybe after a job change. Prayers for a couple who've been trying to have a baby and they've had years and years of infertility. Prayers for our adult children who have totally walked away from their faith. Prayers for a friend or loved one to break free from addiction. Got a couple I'm praying for like that. Prayers for God to heal a relationship, to heal a physical illness, to heal a mental illness. And this is one that I've prayed a lot. Prayers for comfort after a time of great loss. Let's look back at our definitions of resurrection and life. It'll be on the screen. He is the one that can bring that resurrection and life from those prayers you have prayed. <clears throat> Think about the times you have seen Yeshua bring restoration of a broken marriage, 
a life redeemed and reborn after years of addiction and destruction. Maybe you have felt a resurgence of joy after a season of great mourning or a return to life as a prodigal came home. Jesus is the one who resurrects and restores and awakens us from the deaths we experience, not just physical death, deaths of dreams and plans, relationships, hopes. But if he does not answer how we want, when we want, and with what we want, or maybe never answers in our lifetime, do you still believe he's the resurrection? Do you still believe he is the life? The Apostle Paul talked about a prayer that God answered no to in his life. 2 Corinthians 12 should be on screen. Okay. So, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, the revelations being all that he'd been shown about Jesus, a thorn was given to me in the flesh. How many have a thorn in their flesh? You all do. I know you do. We all do. <clears throat> a messenger of Satan to harass me and to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, no, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecution, and calamities. For when I am weak, I am strong. Amen. Amen. You know, Job, my friend Job, I love Job. He knew about calamity, death, and destruction. One of my favorite verses, Job 1, 20 through 21 and Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head. Aren't you glad we don't have to shave our heads when we go in the morning? I would, I'd be having hair this long right now then. Um, and he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord taken, has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I remember one time uh, years ago when, when fellowship was still on the other campus, there was, there was a time on a Sunday morning we sang the song, He gives and takes away, blessed be the name. And great song, truth, truth. And one of the ladies in our D group worked on staff. And she came to D group that week and she said, you're not going to believe this, but we had this ugly letter from someone saying, you should not be playing that song. You not be singing that song because that's just not true. God wouldn't take things away. And I mean, it was like, wait a minute, which Bible are you studying? But because they don't want to think about that, you know, if something bad happens, that, you know, God is a good God and he's not going to do anything. And it's like, mm. so anyway, um, I want you to do me a favor right now. I want you, this is going faster than I thought it would. Okay, turn in your Bible if you have it, or if you just want to look at it on the screen. We're going to look at Habakkuk 3, 17 through 19. If you need to know where Habakkuk is, it's right after Nahum and right before Ze Zephaniah. That gives you a lot of help, right? Okay. <laughs> Remember your Bible drills if you grew up Southern Baptist like me. We present, yeah. But this is, this is something I have turned to several times over the last, uh, I should say over the last few years, I would read through this, and I want you to read through it as, as I, or listen and look at it as I read through it. And then we're going to have a little project we're going to do. Even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer, able to tread upon the heights. I don't know if I came up with this idea on my own, or I, I probably I read somewhere to try to do this. But when you look at those at the first, you know. Part of that, even though 
this happened and, and, and this happened. And even though this happened and this happened. You know, we cannot relate necessarily to fig trees not blossoming or no grapes on our vineyard. Uh, anybody have a vineyard? No. Anybody have cattle? No. It could. You were in Arkansas, you know. But anyway, even the, but in their environment, in this time, this time period of, everybody would be like, oh my, you know. They would know exactly. This, this is devastating. You had to have oil. You had to have figs. You had to have your cattle. I mean, this is, this is, even if all these things happen, Lord, I will still rejoice in you. And so what I did was I wrote, even though, and then I would just write the struggle that I was going through. And I can remember in my mind the things I wrote. Even though, and I'll give you some examples, not of mine, but just to help you. But what I want you to do is turn your paper over where you have some blank space, unless you're a copious news note taker and you've already written on the back. I'm looking at you, Melanie. <laughs> but I want you to take a few minutes and think about what your even those might be. And I'm th I'll throw a few out there just to give you an idea. Even though I'm struggling to hear your voice, Lord, or even though the medical bills are piling up, Lord, or even though I struggle with the same sin issue over and over, even though my child is not speaking to me, still I will praise you. So write, I'm going to give you a couple minutes to write down what are your even those. Just jot a few down. Okay, we're going to, if you'll look back up here. Y'all, I'm so impressed. I mean, y'all been working through this. There's a lot of even those in our life, aren't there? You know, walking this planet, it's hard. But when you look, what I would do at the end of it, even though this, Lord, and this, and this, and this, then you look at verse 18. Yet I will rejoice. I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation because he can resurrect those even those. He can bring life to those seemingly dead situations. This next little bit is not on screens, but I want you to soak it up, ladies. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 18. We now have this light, meaning Jesus, 
shining in our hearts. But we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed. I love that word, perplexed. Do you turn on the news and you're just perplexed? Yeah. But we're not driven to despair. Just turn off that news. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we're not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. Well, we could do a whole lecture on that one thing. Think about that. Our suffering, which at times is very great. There are folks in here who have suffered mightily, maybe still are in this very moment. But our suffering which can be great, is our way to share in the really great suffering that Yeshua suffered for us. Not only did he die such a cruel death, but in the moment of that death, he took on all of our sin. And he knew no sin as a human being. He was sinless, but he took it all on him. And so a small way for Jesus to be seen in our bodies is through our suffering. Through our suffering, he can resurrect. He can bring life. He can shine life out of us even when we're suffering. Even though I will still praise him. I'm going to skip over to verse 16 and finish this up. That is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles that we can, can see now. Let's don't, let's don't stay focused on the even those. Rather, we fix our gaze on that which cannot be seen. For the things we see now are all going to be gone someday. But the things we cannot see will last forever. Amen. In closing, I want to read this hopeful news of John over you. But I thought about reading it over you, but then I think I may want you to join me with it. It should be on the screen. It's Revelation 21, 1 through 5a in the ESV. And so I think we should just say it together because this is an encouragement. This is a, we have to look forward to our resurrection and our life. Okay, ladies, let's do it. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, The dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Hallelujah. Neither shall there be mourning nor dying nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. (laughs) Praise him. Praise him. I am the resurrection and the life. Oh, Jesus, I am so grateful. You give life. And you've given life to all of us here in this room. Lord, we are the re- you are the reason we are here. And we just thank you for opportunities to dig into your word and to 
to hear from you and to be refreshed anew with, with your life and your resurrection that you bring. Lord, I thank you that one day there, are, there is going to be a day where there's no more pain and there's no more crying, no more mourning, no death. Lord, we look, our bodies yearn for that as your children. But Father, while you've left us here on this planet, and even though life does not go smoothly, even though there's hurt and there's pain, there's disappointment and there's death and there's destruction, and when we turn on the television and watch the news, we're perplexed. And Lord, we're prone to be despairing, but Lord, we need not despair because you are sovereign and you are in control. You are on your throne and we can trust you. Father, as we pray in faith and pray in trusting you, increase our faith. Increase our faith. And Lord, thank you for using what little bitty faith we have sometimes to bring glory to yourself and to accomplish your purposes in spite of our lack of of faith. You are so good to us, so good. Lord Jesus, we love you and we praise you for being the great I am. Amen. Thank you, ladies. Thank you so much.